subsection of the rules, client confidentiality. Client confidentiality will make up six to 12% of your total NPRE exam. I really like this section of the rules because I feel like you can truly maximize your chances of success here as it relates to questions that uh, test this material. And that's because if you flip through this whole section, you'll realize that there's not that many rules here. Now, these rules can be tricky, and of course, therefore, the questions can be tricky to test them, but if you spend time memorizing the rules in this section, you'll see that you'll start getting uh, these questions right. So the first place I would like to start is to summarize the differences between the attorney-client privilege and our duty of confidentiality. Then we'll segue into talking about that attorney-client privilege and its exceptions, and then the duty of confidentiality and its exceptions. So in terms of the differences, our attorney-client privilege is technically considered an evidentiary rule, and therefore it's going to prevent a court or a tribunal from using its powers to compel the revelation of confidential communications between an attorney and a client. This is in contrast to our professional obligation of confidentiality, which prohibits the attorneys from voluntarily revealing information that relate to the representation of a client. So stopping there, duty of confidentiality is an ethical rule. The attorney-client privilege is an evidentiary rule that protects us from lawyers from being forced to reveal client confidences to the court. The next difference is the attorney-client privilege protects only confidential communications, whereas the duty of confidentiality covers confidential communications and any other information relating to the representation. I'll remind you about this in a second, but our duty of confidentiality is much broader than the more narrow attorney-client privilege. And the attorney-client privilege only prohibits the disclosure of information. The duty of confidentiality prohibits the disclosure of information and using it against our client. And you're going to see how the uh, duty of confidentiality also pokes its head up again when we talk about conflicts of interest for this very reason. So now that we know the differences, generally speaking, between privilege and confidentiality, let's focus our attention on the attorney-client privilege rule. So the rule says the attorney-client privilege is, remember, evidentiary and that it prevents a court or another governmental entity from using its powers to compel the revelation of confidential communications between an attorney and a client or agents of either attorney or client. So let's define some of those important words we used in this rule statement. Turning first to attorney, this includes anyone authorized or who the client reasonably believes is authorized to practice law in the state. The attorney must be acting as an attorney when the communication is made rather than as a friend or as a business partner. In other words, you always want to check, check the context of the communications. Client, let's define this. This includes prospective clients. So anyone who seeks legal advice or services from an attorney, even if the attorney-client relationship is never established. So if a prospective client comes to you and tells you all about their legal issue but never hires you, the attorney-client privilege as it relates to that confidential communication exists. Now, when it comes to corporate clients, this can be a little trickier because corporations aren't people, but rather they're ran by people. So putting your finger on precisely who the client is and therefore who the privilege relates to can be a hair more challenging. So let's look at how they're defining this. So the rules state that if the client's a corporate client, any communications between any high-ranking official Think like CFO, CEO, and the lawyers will be covered. Further, any communications by an employee and the lawyer are covered. So long as the employee's communicating at the direction of their superior, the employee knows that it's for the purpose to obtain a legal advice for the corporation, and the communication concerns a subject within the scope of the employee's duties to act for the corporation. So I wanna give you a quick example on that point. Um, let's say a company hires a lawyer to investigate some suspected fraud they think is going on internally. And they ask the lawyer to you know, interview specific employees in specific departments within the company. So the lawyer is specifically directed to interview a buyer. The buyer is told by his superior, the president, to answer the attorney's questions. And during this questioning, the buyer, the employee, admits that he has entered into a whole bunch of illegal agreements. Um, he's set prices and it, it basically amounts to fraud, which is the precise thing the attorney was there to investigate. Uh, the attorney takes this information and relays it back to you know, the president and the board of directors. They decide to terminate that buyer quietly um, and let him part ways. 
and they don't turn that information over to the police. Later, a client sues the corporation by virtue of these fraudulent practices, and the client calls this lawyer who had investigated the matter to the stand and essentially asked whether or uh, tried to ask the, the lawyer some of these questions, basically to divulge information that the employee had said to the lawyer in the interview process. And the question is whether or not the company could assert privilege uh, based upon that communication between the lawyer and the employee that they had fired? And the answer was yes. Why? Because the employee was talking to the lawyer uh, by virtue of his direct, uh, direct uh, supervisor's uh, order. He was speaking to the lawyer for the purposes of legal advice, so he understood you know, why the communication was occurring. And lastly, he was talking to the lawyer about something that was in his uh, scope of his employment. So turning to the definition of communication, this is defined as information passed from the client to the attorney or agents of either. And confidential is a big one. So we define this as something that the person reasonably believes no outsider will hear. So again, context matters for these fact patterns. Statements are not confidential if a third party who does not reasonably need to be part of the conversation is present. I like these examples that follow, it really drives that point home. So if a client brings her accountant to a meeting and an attorney has a legal secretary present to take notes, as well as an interpreter uh, to interpret the client's foreign language, confidentiality isn't destroyed. The idea here is all of those third parties present are present so the parties can communicate. There's someone there taking notes. There's an interpreter there helping communication between the lawyer and the client. There's an accountant present likely there to answer questions or to assist the client in helping the lawyer. So here we would have privilege even though there's third parties present. But check out the second example. If a client has a discussion in a coffee shop where other customers can easily hear the conversation, then there's no privilege. So again, context matters. So now that you know what is attorney-client privilege, and you have a better idea of what those key words we use in that rule statement mean, let's talk about what's not protected by the attorney-client privilege. So first, generally the identity of our clients and our free arrangements aren't covered absent exceptional circumstances. So just to stop there, identities of our clients, the reason we can divulge that information is usually because we have to. Think about conflicts of interest and trying to detect conflicts of interest. We often have to divulge client names to determine if there is a potential problem. This information really isn't giving up anything that's private. Further, remember, there is rules that regulate lawyers in the fee agreements that they reach with their clients. So it would be really silly to have rules that regulate our fee agreements and then make those fee agreements privileged because then we can never be truly regulated as it relates to those agreements. The second exception about what's not covered with attorney-client privilege is pre-existing documents and evidence. Uh, please be careful with this. I have seen some questions floating around. Remember, the attorney-client privilege protects those communications between the attorney and the client, not evidence, not pre-existing documents or things. So look at your second example under that. A client comes into attorney's office and says, I just stabbed my boyfriend with this knife and I killed him. So stopping there, the communication, literally the speaking between the attorney and the client is going to be privileged um, as it relates to the knife, which is clearly evidence relating to this um, event. The lawyer shall not take that knife. If he does, he needs to give it to the authorities. So that's why we say he shouldn't take the knife. Now, the attorney can tell the client to go put the knife back where she found it. Uh, the attorney can't tell the client to go hide the knife or destroy the knife or anything like that. Uh, because again, doing so would be problematic. So to be clear, the evidence, the knife is not protected, but the communication, that admission of guilt essentially between the two is protected. So with the attorney-client privilege, your client holds the privilege, it is theirs uh, to waive or to assert. Uh, in other words, they're the holder of it. Now the duty does lie with the lawyer, however, to invoke privilege on behalf of the client if they're not there to claim it for themselves. This privilege lasts forever. Um, it outlives or tr uh, lives past the termination of the attorney-client relationship. So even once attorney and client part ways, the attorney still has to keep that confidential information protected. And it even survives death. So even once the client's dead, this means the lawyer still has to keep that information protected. They can't go and just share it with everyone.
Now, there are four exceptions to privilege. And as you can imagine, these uh, questions will likely test the exceptions, not just the general rule. So be sure you're reviewing these. The first exception is that it doesn't apply if the client is seeking the attorney's services to engage in or to assist in a future crime or fraud. So if a client sits down in the lawyer's office and tells the lawyer that he needs help lying on a business loan application, that communication is not privileged. Um, why? Because while it might be a confidential communication between the lawyer and the client, it's only being made because this client wants to break the law and wants the lawyer's help. So it's not protected. The second exception, it does not apply to a communication that's relevant to an issue of breach, either by the attorney or by the client, of duties that arise out of their relationship. So let's say a client is months behind paying lawyer for her past services relating to his divorce. Lawyer can file a lawsuit against that client to try to recover these past due fees. Lawyer is also able to divulge statements made by the client relating to his lack of payment. Lawyer can, however, reveal information relating to the client's divorce that's unrelated to the payment. So in other words, this kind of exception is narrow. The lawyer can only reveal as much information as is necessary um, relevant to that issue of breach. The lawyer can't just let everyone know about all of this privileged communication between the two regarding the divorce. No, the narrow exception as, is as to the communications regarding payment. The third exception, it does not apply in civil litigation between two persons who are formerly joint clients of the attorney. So this is probably the trickiest one for most people. This is why most people do not agree to joint representation with a lawyer because it can be um, unfortunate for them in the, in the outcome, depending on what happens with their case. So let's look at the example. It says a lawyer represents clients A and B in a business transaction. Later, A sues B regarding that previous business deal. Neither A nor B can claim privilege to prevent either party from repeating things said between the lawyer a and B in that previous transaction. So this is why before lawyers take on joint representations of clients, they really should warn them about this issue and about this exception to privilege. The theory behind this rule, which might make more sense to you, um, is when you have joint clients, the rule is treating the joint clients as one. So these two clients are one person for the purposes of this rule. And as a result, you can't assert privilege against yourself. So A can't assert privilege against B because it would be tantamount to A asserting privilege against A. Likewise, B can't assert privilege against A because it would be like B asserting privilege against B, which just doesn't make any sense. So this is the risk that they're taking by agreeing to joint representation, that they can both divulge information that was uh, communicated between themselves and the attorney, even confidentially, regarding this transaction. And the fourth exception says it does not apply when the attorney can furnish evidence about the competency or intention of a client who gives or attempts to give property by will or dream life. Um, so let's say a client has a lawyer draft a will, leaving all of her property to one of her two kids. Client brings lawyer a list of reasons why she's disinheriting one of her children. Upon client's death, the disinherited child contests the will. The lawyer can furnish evidence of the client's capacity um, in her wish to disinherit that child. So while technically it is divulging some confidential communications, uh, this exception speaks to a situation where the lawyer can do so ethically. So now that you've covered privilege, you know the general rule and you know the exceptions, let's turn to that duty of confidentiality. So we'll talk about the general rule and then I want to compare and contrast it just briefly again to the attorney-client privilege. So what is the rule about confidentiality? Well, it tells us that a lawyer shall not reveal information relating to the representation of a client unless the client gives their informed consent or the disclosure is impliedly authorized in order to carry out the representation or disclosure is permitted. The confidentiality rule applies to both matters communicated in confidence by the client to the lawyer and all information relating to that representation, whatever its source may be. So comparing and contrasting this rule to the attorney-client privilege, I hope you see that duty of confidentiality is much broader um, because it's not just going to protect those things that are directly communicated between the lawyer and the client, but everything else that lawyer learns about the representation throughout the representation, no matter who he or she learns it from. So let me give you a quick example, not in your outline. Let's say I'm a personal injury attorney and you hire me to represent you in your alleged injuries. 
and you sit down with me one day in my office, we shut the door, and we're having a private conversation about all of your alleged injuries by virtue of this accident, and I'm taking notes, and you're telling them to me. All of that information you give me would fall under the attorney-client privilege. Why? Because it's a communication between the lawyer and the client, um, and we're treating it as confidential, and therefore it is. It's privileged. However, you know, you leave my office and um, you give me permission to get your medical records because, of course, I need to study your med medical records to build my case. Um, and I study your medical records. My paralegal helps me study them and summarize them. Well, everything that I'm learning in those medical records is not privileged. Why? Because you're not reading them to me. Therefore, it's not a communication between the attorney and the client, but it's information I'm learning throughout the representation about the representation, and therefore it's confidential. Um, additionally, the injuries that you told me about when we met in my office would also be confidential because it's information relating to the representation. So you can see here how privilege is narrow. It would only cover that communication where confidentiality would cover that communication and so much more. It would cover everything I learned about you in the review of your medical records. So now that you have, I hope, a bigger picture about confidentiality, please note that the duty of confidentiality lasts forever. It continues after the lawyer-client relationship has terminated and even survives death, so like privilege. So let's talk about disclosures that are expressly or impliedly authorized by your client. So the rule specifically says, you know, we shall not be revealing information relating to the representation unless you have informed consent from your client. That's the first instance you can. And as you can imagine, you won't get a lot of questions that test this on the MPRE because it's a little too straightforward. But if your client expressly authorizes you as their attorney to reveal information, then you can reveal it. The rule goes on to say that if you don't have that um, informed consent from your client, you can disclose information if disclosure is impliedly authorized in order to carry out the representation. So let's dive deeper into what that means. The rules tell us that there are specifically two situations in which this implied authorization exists, so therefore you should be familiar with both. The first situation in which implied authorization exists is when um, you are making disclosures about a client to, in order to carry out the representation of them. Um, and now, this is unless your client has given you specific instructions to the contrary. So assuming that's not the case, you're allowed to reveal information that is necessary for you to do your job, to carry out uh, the representation of them. I really like the example in your outline on this point, so I do want to point it out. It says that in some situations, lawyers can be impliedly authorized to admit a fact that can't be properly disputed or to make a disclosure that will facilitate a satisfactory conclusion to a matter. So if a lawyer is representing a woman in a divorce case, she, uh, the lawyer could admit that the woman makes $500 a month selling her candles on Etsy, even if this would ultimately reduce the alimony award that she would receive. Why? Because this is an honest disclosure that would be necessary to resolve an alimony dispute. The way I like to think of this is it's something that couldn't be denied. The court can get their hands on this woman's tax records. They're going to see that she has an income, and therefore it's the type of thing the court expects the lawyer to um tell them when making this type of decision regarding alimony, so the lawyer would have to do that. There would be this implied authorization to carry out that representation. Another example not in your outline, let's say you're a personal injury attorney and someone hires you to defend them in a car accident case because they got sued for hitting someone. And let's say the complaint um, against your client says that they were driving down Main Street at 5 p.m. on the day in question. It would be very hard to deny that fact if your client admits to being part of the car accident. Now, your client might deny fault. That's totally a different story. But if your client admits to being part of the accident, you would likely have to admit the fact that he or she was present at that time and place when the alleged accident took place. So again, that would be confidential information that you'd be impliedly authorized to disclose because you would have to, to be able to carry out your representation of the client. Now, the second instance of implied authorization, because I said there are two, is that lawyers in a law firm uh, throughout the firm's practice and in the course of their practice can disclose to each other information relating to the client of a firm. Unless, again, the client has instructed that particular information not be given to certain lawyers um, or the like. 
So the way I like to think of this rule is, you know, big law firms have reputations and a lot of people want to hire a big law firm because they see it as a lot of power behind their case. They know that all of those lawyers are ultimately going to be able to work together on their legal matter and they like that. It's kind of like this assumption we all have. Hence this rule. We know that when you hire a firm, um, unless there's specific instructions to the contrary, uh, one lawyer isn't necessarily going to be the only one that touches your case. They're going to rely on the other expertise and the other lawyers in the firm to help them out and to give them guidance. And uh, clients often like that. And that's an instance of implied authorization. So to stop there and to recap, the way I like to think of the duty of confidentiality is kind of having three parts. You shall not reveal confidential information relating to the representation of a client unless you have one of these three things. The first is that um, can informed consent from your client, which you likely won't have for purposes of the MPRE. Two is one of these implied authorization scenarios. Remember, there are two instances in which this exists. We just covered them. Now, the third instance you could reveal uh, confidential information is if one of these exceptions we're about to talk about apply. Now, there are six exceptions. I know that's a lot, but you should do your best to memorize them because as you can imagine, just like I said with attorney-client privilege, most of our questions will test these exceptions. So let's turn to them. The, they, it starts by telling us that a lawyer may reveal information relating to the representation of a client to the extent the lawyer reasonably believes is necessary. I just want to start there. The rule uses the word may. So if one of these situations apply, you never have to reveal information, but you can if you want. So the first exception is to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm. So if you have information and you want to disclose it because it could prevent that reasonably certain death or great bodily harm, then you could do so without getting in any ethical trouble. The second exception is our crime fraud exception, but this is much more narrow than many people think. So let's look at the language of the rule. It says you can reveal information to prevent your client from committing a crime or a fraud that's reasonably certain to result in a substantial injury to the financial interests or property of another, and in furtherance of which the client has used or is using the lawyer's services. So to be clear here, if your fact pattern tells you that a client tells a lawyer that they committed a crime or a fraud in the past tense, and they're just hiring the lawyer to represent them in the criminal matter, this it doesn't apply then. This only applies if the lawyer has been used or is being used to commit a crime or a fraud. So make sure you're reading these scenarios very carefully. The third exception is all about ethics. To secure legal advice about the lawyer's compliance with these rules. Uh, however, the attorney should not reveal enough to disclose the identity or exact circumstances of the client or scenario that they're asking about. In other words, many states have ethics hotlines that they can call and basically give a hypothetical situation and ask someone um, basically for advice about their compliance with these rules. And you're allowed to do that as a lawyer because of course we want lawyers to comply with these rules, but they just have to be sure that they're not giving up the client's like name or identity or enough information to identify that client. The fourth exception is to establish a claim or a defense on behalf of the lawyer in a controversy between the lawyer and the client, or to establish a defense to a criminal charge or a civil claim against the lawyer based upon conduct in which the client was involved, or to respond to allegations in any proceeding concerning the lawyer's representation of a client. So here we like to call this preemptive self-defense. Please keep that in mind. You as a lawyer are allowed to exercise your rights under this exception, even if you have not yet been sued or even if you have not yet been charged. So if you know something is coming and you need to uh, reveal information to clear the air about your participation in something or to protect yourself, you can. You do not have to wait until you've been sued or until you're cuffed in the back of a cop car, for instance. So let's talk about your example in your outline that follows that exception. It says, attorney defended uh, defendant in a larceny case. Defendant admitted to stealing the property at issue. Attorney refused to call an alibi witness whom the attorney knew would testify falsely. If defendant sues the attorney for malpractice, attorney can reveal the confidential statements made by the defendant to show why the attorney did not call that alibi witness um, and therefore has a defense to the malpractice claim. 
So you can see how this uh, ability to reveal information is there to protect the lawyer, but again, it's limited. The lawyer needs to just be careful that they're only revealing as much information as is necessary. The fifth exception to confidentiality is to comply with law or court order. So absent getting that informed consent from your client, the lawyer should always assert on behalf of the client any and all non-frivolous claims uh, that the order in question is not authorized by law or that the information being sought by the court um, is protected against the attorney-client privilege or any other applicable law. In the event of some sort of adverse ruling, the lawyer must consult with their client about the possibility of an appeal. And unless review is sought, these, this exception permits the lawyer to comply with that court order or law requiring um, revealing that confidential information. So turn to your example on this point. A court orders that a lawyer is required to divulge a client confidence. So the lawyer should assert every single non-frivolous argument in an attempt to avoid being forced to divulge this client information. Now, if he loses, and therefore if the client loses, he should consult his client about the possibility of an appeal. If the client doesn't want to appeal, then the lawyer will need to comply with that court order and divulge that information. And then the sixth and final exception is all about conflicts of interest. So here to detect and to resolve conflicts of interest that arise either from the lawyer's change of employment between law firms or changes in the composition or ownership of a firm, but only if the revealed information would not compromise the attorney-client privilege or otherwise prejudice the client. So in this instance, um, maybe lawyers switching firms or two firms merging together, they really should do their due diligence to make sure that there isn't going to be a conflict of interest between their client files of everything becomes one. So in doing so, they can reveal some information to try to detect these conflicts of interest. And the rule tells us that these disclosures should ordinarily include no more than the identity of the persons and entities involved in the matter, like the client name, basically. A brief summary of the general issues that are involved. In other words, like what are you doing for the client, generally speaking, and information about whether or not this is terminated or ongoing. In other words, is it a current client or a former client? So again, it needs to be limited just to that purpose of trying to detect any potential conflict of interest. So just to recap, Please memorize the rule and the exceptions, and it's gonna put you in a great position to answer these questions. I have one final example that I think will really just kind of drive the point home, um, and it's just generally about confidentiality. Let's say this guy named Darren uh, commits fraud and he gets charged with fraud. Um, he hires a criminal defense lawyer to represent him in this criminal action. And when the lawyer, you know, takes on this case, the lawyer is asking Darren questions about the event, and Darren admits to the lawyer that he in fact committed the crime in question. First of all, is this information privileged? Yes. Why? Because it's a, a confidential communication between the lawyer and the client. Is it confidential? Yes. It's information that the lawyer is learning about the case throughout his representation of the client from the client. Now, can the lawyer divulge this confidential information? And the answer is going to be no, not unless there's informed consent from the client, unless he's impliedly authorized to carry out the, uh, the representation or one of these exceptions apply, which based on the limited fact pattern I gave you, none do. So that duty of confidentiality means he has to keep all that information confidential. And that wraps up this section.